Hi, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel here at UCSD and on UCTV, and I'm really pleased today to be with Igor Grant, a distinguished professor of psychiatry here at UCSD. Uh, Igor's work has been extremely influential in the uh, brain and behavior field, and I'm going to have him talk about that. But uh, first, let me say welcome, Igor. Thank, Thank you, you for Bill. being here. Tell us about you, your, your training, your areas of interest, and, uh, and just basically a little bit about you before maybe telling us more about the science. Sure. Well, I actually came to an interest in medicine a little bit later. I um, originally was um, training to be an engineer and decided I didn't like that very much and then ended up taking some biology courses, which did fascinate me. And then um, got accepted at the University of British Columbia. Um, and there I was fortunate to have a professor of physiology as one of my mentors, actually a, a fellow by the name of D. Harold Kopp, who actually discovered calcitonin, one of the uh, hormones that regulates uh, calcium. So I was able to spend some time in research uh, with Professor Kopp, and that got me interested in, I guess, science and research in particular. And then I became more interested in uh, behavior and how the brain and uh, behavior interact, and that's what attracted me to psychiatry. Um, so, uh, and as a psychiatry resident, then I continued my interest in research. And uh, of course, um, the first area that I was um, doing some work in was very popular at the time and is now popular again, and that's uh, marijuana. Hmm. And the question was, uh, is it the case that uh, marijuana really produced all these behavioral problems in uh, otherwise healthy people and made them motivational and got them to lose their memory and so forth? Mm. So as a resident, I did a project uh, with one of my professors where we um, used neurocognitive testing to examine actually pan medical students, some hmm. of whom were marijuana users and some were not, and um, so we did this study. We basically found nothing because these were very bright people and they weren't very heavy users. But anyway, that kind of started my interest in this whole neurobehavioral, neurocognitive research. And through your career, this uh, mm -hmm. real world identification of problems and understanding the science behind those problems, those behavioral problems, it's really been a theme through your whole career. Yes, that's right. And so um, currently, you know, we're very interested in the intersection of um, drugs of abuse, in this case methamphetamine, for instance, and uh, an infection, which is HIV. HIV, as probably people will know, can cause mental problems. It can cause cognitive problems. That is, people have difficulties in memory, uh, attention, and uh, other kinds of uh, mental processing, and so we were very curious as to, first of all, how does HIV do this? And since many people who have HIV also have substance use problems, how do those two interact? And so our studies really range from um, very basic studies with some of my colleagues that involve, um, um, you know, basic science methods and uh, animal models, uh, neuropathology and people who die uh, all the way to behavioral uh, observations and neuroimaging, these kinds of things. So it's a ton of different kind of, kinds of data. <clears throat> Is there a theme that runs across those different levels of analysis that are really in teaching us about HIV? And Yeah, and I think it's basically trying to see what are the basic uh, mechanisms uh, of injury with HIV, um, and uh, one dominant theme is inflammation, and particularly neuroinflammation. And then um, is it the case that you have to have, for example, the virus sitting in your brain, or can it trigger these inflammatory pathways without actually being in there? Or maybe it was there at one point and then set off a, a train of events that keep going uh, that um, then produce injury. And then what are the effects of these other uh, cofactors like drugs? What about getting older? Because people now live long with modern treatments but there's some evidence that they may decline cognitively a little bit faster, and that may have to do with this chronic neuroinflammatory pressure. We're learning more and more about inflammation in the context of neurological disorders, brain disorders, I should say. We didn't think before that Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other disorders like that were really involving much in the way of immune 
disruptions, but we know now that they are. And in fact, the argument in Alzheimer's disease is that this is a portion of the disease, a very large part of the chronicity of the disease that really injures the brain. So downstream from what initiating event might be, Inflammation's a problem. Say more about what goes on in HIV, if you will. Well, so in HIV, we have several things that come together. <clears throat> One is, of course, if you are infected with HIV, you have viruses present in, present in the body, <clears throat> and these are circulating, and some of these cross the blood-brain barrier and take up residence, if you will, uh, in some of the immune cells in the brain. So then uh, these immune cells are like little virus factories, basically. They keep churning out more virus. The virus particles themselves or the uh, proteins that the virus produces may themselves trigger immune responses. Uh, so they may, for example, interact with astrocytes, which are uh, important uh, support cells and cells that uh, support the energy and nutritional needs of, um, of, of our nerve cells. So if these cells then are activated and, and they start per potentially churning out products that themselves are injurious uh, to the neuron or uh, the, these supportive cells themselves become damaged and so they can't do their work. So it can be both kinds of uh, processes. So that's the viral side of the picture. And then the other side is, as I say, uh, these cascades get set up so that the virus may no longer be replicating, that is reproducing itself in the brain, but uh, tiny fragments of, of virus may still be being produced by the cells, and that can continue triggering this immune response. So those are some aspects of, uh, of what we're uh, looking at. So it's not enough to be thinking about the virus itself. One has to be thinking about the events that are downstream from that viral well, that's infection. That's right, that's it's right. A really a fascinating area of neurobiology and I think, uh, again, one that you've made so many important contributions to. Tell me a little bit more about some of the more recent work you're doing and, and uh, what the direction for that is. Well, as I mentioned, one of the things we're interested in is, is the intersection of drugs of abuse um, and HIV. Uh, and in our community in Southern California, methamphetamine is a big uh, drug of abuse in a section, at least, of the HIV population and probably leads to people becoming infected in the first place. They use drugs. Uh, they become disinhibited. They do behaviors they wouldn't ordinarily do. They use protections they wouldn't normally use and so on and so forth. Um, we know that methamphetamine itself actually can tr trigger uh, inflammatory changes without HIV. So the question is how do those two things interact? Uh, methamphetamine also can be damaging to mit mitochondria, which are kind of the energy, energy um, I guess, organelles uh, of the body. And so if these are damaged uh, and uh, not functioning properly, that can also produce more inflammation and more uh, neural injury. So our, our recent work is trying to look at this intersection of mechanisms and then to look at neuroprotective factors as well. So for example, some drugs of abuse like cannabis uh, seem not to have these effects. They actually may be protective in certain ways. Uh, so that might be, an, that's an interesting um, area to look at is um, neuroprotectants that may be based on the cannabinoid system. So in, what's pretty clear is that one then has a basic biology of HIV, of methamphetamine, of the interaction between the two. But then there's, the, there's a huge public health element as well. Mm -hmm. S speak to your involvement in that and where do, you, where do you see the next five years going in terms of helping people avoid this infection in the first place? Well, of course, at the, most, at the largest sweep of it, uh, it's, it's best never to get infected uh, rather than be treating and doing things like this. That really, in, in my mind, involves a public policy that is very open, that recognizes that we are not all saints, that uh, people will do things that are not good for them, and how do we spare them uh, from getting, uh, you know, infected? So, uh, you know, obviously the use of safe sex, the use of pre-exposure prophylaxis, which means uh, administering uh, antiviral drugs to people who are at risk to become infected. It's a little bit like 
If you were to go to uh, some place where malaria is endemic, you wouldn't wait till you got malaria and treat it. You would take the, the preventive medicine to, to stop the infection in the first place. Destigmatizing the behavior in order to help people avoid the behavior. Right. and avoid the consequences of that behavior. Or to behave in a safer way. Mm -hmm. So if someone is going to have uh, uh, you know, certain kinds of sexual practices, how do you protect yourself? Correct. Yeah. Or if you don't protect yourself in that moment, uh, you know, how do you do at least post-exposure prophylaxis? Right. But all of this requires an openness, not that we applaud behaviors, but we um, understand they exist and that uh, a better social good is served by, uh, you know, being open about it. Yeah, wonderful. We talked earlier about um, the whole issue of cognitive stress and, and how it can be very difficult for people who care for others right. to deal with this stress in their lives. Speak, speak a little bit about your work in that context, especially as it relates to caring for people with Alzheimer's disease. Right, so we've had a program of research for quite a while um, on um, how does chronic stress uh, affect uh, immune and cardiovascular function as well as mood and uh, you know, uh, psychological function, obviously, in people who are under chronic pressure, the pressure of caregiving. I might say, as a, just backing up, because you asked me at the beginning, kind of where did you come from mm -hmm. in this, that that's, again, another thing that goes back to my training. Uh, again, I trained at the University of Pennsylvania and um, had a, a, a mentor who was interested in um, chronic stress and how you measure it. And I was, at that point, very interested in psychosomatic medicine and um, had the question of, well, how does stress affect uh, diabetic control in people who are insulin dependent? Because there's, there was some evidence that people spill more sugar and are less well controlled if they're very stressed. And so we got into a study along these lines, uh, which actually showed, yes, that uh, glucose control is worse in people under certain kinds of chronic stress. But that then led me more to this question of in a more vulnerable population, and older people are more vulnerable to these various kinds of inflammatory and um, cardiovascular changes, you know, how could that affect their health? We know that um, in our country, most of the Alzheimer care is really provided in the home, usually by a spouse mm -hmm. uh, who is himself or herself elderly. Mm -hmm. So our studies really are looking at um, how severely ill is the person with Alzheimer's, how behaviorally challenging are those people, uh, and then uh, looking at how does this affect parameters like sleep, mood, um, um, immune function measures, measures of stress, uh, psychobiological measures, and so forth. Where the work is going now is actually looking at, for example, we know that prior to developing atherosclerosis, you, the, the thickness of your vessels increases, so-called intima media thickness. Well, we're measuring these over time in people who are caregiving and under various degrees of stress to see whether, in fact, there are these physiologic changes that could be effectively bad for the caregiver. And then how can we relieve that stress on the caregiver? It's such an important topic. The Alzheimer's Association nationally, but also Alzheimer's San Diego is obviously very eager to uh, support caregivers. And, right. Uh, I can readily imagine that stress would be part of their everyday life. Yeah. Caring for a loved one who has it was compromised. So this is really important work. And even though it may not be as dramatically evident that somebody's suffering, clearly that's the case. And there's well, physiology to support that. That's right. And also what's um, interesting is that this, this research, I think, has a novel element that we basically have taken the laboratory to the home. So rather than have uh, the husband or wife come into our lab, which may itself be stressful because then you have to find a way to look after your loved one in order to come to your research program, we uh, pack all of this equipment to the person's home and so we do the physiologic measures and, and so forth right in the home, blood drawing and things like that. And we think that that's a more naturalistic environment uh, to do this kind of work.
It's very exciting. Igor, yeah. we're really so pleased to have a chance to interview you, and uh, we uh, congratulate you on terrific work, and please keep it up. We need it. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Bill Mobley for The Brain Channel.